Good afternoon, everybody, or morning or evening, maybe where you are. You are here for another amazing live stream from the Geo Institute, and this time it's one with our great partners at Keller. This is episode five of the Keller Seismic Series. I'm Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we, of course, are thrilled to have you with us yet again, wherever you happen to be today. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I, if there were more than 100%, I would give you more than a 100% guarantee that you would enjoy what you're going to see today. But if you fall into that camp, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. And there are many good things there. While you are at geoinstitute.org learning more about us, Maybe you would like to uh, make a contribution to our student participation fund and support our students. 100% of all the money that you put into that supports student programs. It is 100% tax deductible. If you make a $96 contribution and join the 96 Club, you can receive a Carl Terzaghi bobblehead while they last. There aren't many left, so you want to get on that. The new one are these handsome GI socks. The shield in action. Now, the main event. Peter Robertson, 2015 Seed Lecturer, will be presenting to you today. And to tell you a little bit more about that is our friend from Keller, Tim Avery. The mustache is looking great. It just keeps on going. People can go watch every episode of the series and see it progress. Tim, take my it away. My mustache grow and my hair fall out. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> This is a fifth of our six presentations in our Keller Seismic Knowledge Lecture Series. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for today's event, Dr. Peter Robertson. Dr. Robertson received his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering at Nottingham University in England. He later went to the University of British Columbia to receive both his Master's and PhD in Geotechnical Engineering. He brings with him over three decades of unparalleled expertise as an educator, researcher, consultant, and practitioner in the realm of geotechnical engineering. Throughout his career, Dr. Robertson has focused on several critical areas, including in-situ testing of soils, earthquake design of geotechnical structures, soil liquefaction, pile design, and soil structure interactions. His contributions have earned him international recognition as a leading authority in in-situ testing and soil liquefaction. Currently serving as technical advisor to Greg Drilling and Testing in California, Dr. Robertson's influence continues to grow, shaping advancements in geotechnical engineering. Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Robertson here to present a concise overview of the latest advances in evaluating soil liquefaction using the cone penetration test. The floor is yours, Dr. Robertson. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Tim. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Uh, I'll try to change my cursor over to a laser. So welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to have this opportunity to present. Uh, and so my goal today is I, I want to talk about application of the cone penetration test to evaluate soil liquefaction. And so as an overview, I'd, I'd like to give a sort of a, um, a brief overview of the advances in evaluating liquefaction using the CPT. And I'm also going to include a brief discussion on the role of risk and uncertainty in a liquefaction assessment. And you'll see why in the first few slides. A little bit of a disclaimer, you know, I, I, uh, some of the things I say will be my personal opinion on some topics. And uh, of course, occasionally, uh, selective bias uh, may creep into some of my comments. Now, Professor Morgenstern, who I had the pleasure of working with when I was at the University of Alberta uh, a couple of years ago, uh, he coined this uh, phrase that we're, we're entering a period where we're going from certainty to uncertainty. And uh, what essentially he's meaning by that is that, you know, risk and uncertainty are, are characteristics of geotechnical engineering due to the uncertainties and variabilities in 
material properties, external loads, analytical models and interpretation. And so design approaches are evolving to account for uncertainty. And I used to say to graduate students, somewhat as a, as a, as a joke, but, but really to catch their attention, and I would say to them that most of what we do in geotechnical engineering is strictly incorrect. The art is to get the right answer. Uh, because much of what we do in engineering is we, we make simplifying assumptions, et cetera. And so one could argue in the end, we can't possibly be getting the right answer because we're, we're doing such simplified uh, assumptions. But yet uh, the art of good geotechnical engineering is of course to get the right answer, to get the correct answer. So let me briefly discuss how design methods uh, are evolving. Uh, in recent years, I've been working quite a lot in the mine tailing industry, and this is particularly noticeable in that industry. Uh, but I think it applies more generally to uh, all areas of geotechnical engineering. And so historically, a lot of what we did was prescriptive in nature, where we would have prescribed factors of safety, uh, and most of our approaches were deterministic. And they were mostly relatively simplistic. You know, for slope stability, it was traditional that we would design slopes to a factor of safety of 1.5 or greater. Increasingly, we've moved more to performance-based design approaches, and that's essentially where we're now focusing um, uh, more on damage and loss. So the focus is often on deformation. So we're trying to predict the performance of things. So how much will they uh, deform? what would be the resulting damage and loss. And increasingly, these approaches are becoming probabilistic. And Steve Kramer gave a very nice seed lecture in 2018, and I've given the link here. And uh, he gives a very nice overview of performance-based approach as it uh, applies to uh, seismic and liquefaction analysis. Uh, so it's a well worth uh, watching that that YouTube recording of his seed lecture, because he gives a very nice overview. And it sort of covers right from simplified approaches through to very complex approaches. And he uses that under the term performance base. Now, increasingly, we're moving to risk informed, which is in, in some respects an extension of performance based. Uh, but it's where um, the design is informed. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. Down. Yeah. Um, where design uh, is informed by appropriate assessments of risks and un uncertainty. And it's mostly probabilistic in nature. Um, so that, that's the general trend of how we're seeing designs evolve. And if, if we try and, oh, no. um, what do we mean by risk? Uh, risk is actually the combination of the likelihood of something and the resulting consequences. It's actually the, the, the multiple of those two. So risk combines the probability and severity of an adverse event. So in, in simple terms, risk is saying you have to ask yourself three questions. So what can happen? So if, if we're talking about seismic liquefaction, often that the hazard is the earthquake. So the thing that could happen is, is a major earthquake. And then how likely is it that it will happen? And so how likely is the earthquake? And of course, how likely is, is the possible liquefaction? And then if it does happen, what are the consequences? How bad could it be if all of this happens? And what is the acceptable risk? And uh, in the dam design world, um, the Bureau of Reclamation and, and FERC and others have evolved into charts uh, like the one on the left. And the chart on the left shows uh, the estimated annual probability of failure, where at the top it's it's a low probability of 10 to the minus two, so one in 100, all the way down to 10 to the minus eight at the bottom. So 10 to the minus six is one in a million. And then on the horizontal axis, the, the consequence here is the number of fatalities. It doesn't have to be fatalities, it's whatever consequences are um, applicable to the project. And for many complex projects, it may be a combination of things such as potential loss of life, economic costs, environmental damages, reputational damages, et cetera. So all of which come under this general heading of, of consequence. So when we talk about risk, risk is higher when you've got higher likelihood and higher consequences, and risk is lower when you have lower likelihood and lower consequences. So you, you see this acceptable region and, and an unacceptable region. 
and in the in the dams and uh, the, the water retaining dams and and also in the tailings structures they also identify a region called alar which is as low as reasonably possible um, so for for large high risk projects this issue can come into it now i gave a presentation to the canadian geotechnical society earlier this year they have a, a thing called the distinguished lecture so i think it was in march uh, and I talked about risk and uncertainty in more detail there. So if you're interested and if you're a member of the Canadian Geotechnical Society, you can go to their website, go to the member side and you can access that presentation. Now, when it comes to liquefaction, I always find it useful to just remind ourselves that what do we mean by liquefaction? Because it's a generic term that often gets misused. And so um, many years ago, 25 odd years ago, I suggested that we should go with these two terms. And that is essentially cyclic liquefaction, sometimes referred to as seismic liquefaction, because it's typically earthquakes that are, are the hazard that, that trigger it. And so this is where you have uh, a condition where you get cyclic loading, you can get shear stress reversal, and that eventually can increase pore pressures to the condition where you can essentially get to zero effective stress during the cyclic loading. And when you get to zero effective stress, you get very large deformations and you can get significant damages. So it's generally uh, level or gently sloping ground because you've got to get shear stress reversal. And you can get very large deformations if the earthquake are big uh, and the, the soils are loose enough. And so on the right here, I show an image from Moss Landing of the earthquake back in the late 1990s, I think it was, in uh, California. Uh, but there's also flow, or sometimes referred to as static liquefaction. I prefer flow because sometimes an earthquake can be the trigger for flow liquefaction. So it's not always a static trigger. And so this is where you have a strain softening uh, response in undrained loading. And you've got relatively steeply sloping ground. So you've got relatively high shear stresses. And those shear stresses are higher than the liquefied undrained strength. And so that can result in a flow slide. And on the right here, I show an image from the Fundal Tailings Dam of 2015 in Brazil, where the Fundal Dam here on the right uh, suddenly failed and flowed downstream. Uh, and in fact, flowed 600 kilometers all the way to the Atlantic uh, Ocean. So a significant flow slide and, and resulted in the death of 19 people. So let's first talk about uh, cyclic liquefaction, and, and most of the presentation will focus on that because, after all, this is the killer seismic knowledge lecture. So I assumed the focus should be more on on seismic liquefaction. So what do we, uh, you know, it's generally level or gently sloping ground, or you could have level ground with a, a steep slope uh, nearby, uh, often referred to as a free face. Uh, so the sequence that's usually followed for for seismic liquefaction is first you want to determine uh, are the materials susceptible to cyclic liquefaction? In other words, what's the likelihood they could actually liquefy? And then next thing is, uh, is the seismic event big enough to actually trigger cyclic liquefaction? Again, what's the likelihood it will be triggered? And then uh, if it is triggered, uh, evaluate what the post-earthquake deformations and then damages and losses could be. In other words, what would be the consequences if the first two should occur? So let's ha have a summary on uh, what the lab testing implies. I actually took this, um, uh, this I stole it from a previous presentation uh, from Armin um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and so Unfortunately, because of the way his slides were, the, the first uh, set of uh, data looks a little bit gray, but, but it still captures what the intent is. And so he quite nicely showed three sets of lab data from sand-like soils that were non-plastic through to clay-like soils that had a PI of about 26. And the middle soil is sort of in the middle there. It's got a PI of 13. So let's work our way through. So the first sand-like soil, uh, you, you, you get this shear stress reversal. If you look at the second plot, so as the shear stresses are going up and then they reverse down, you build up pore pressure and the stress path migrates progressively to the left and then eventually gets to the condition of zero effective stress. And then if you look at the stress strain curve, initially the stress strain cur curves are quite stiff. And then as the buildup of pore pressure occurs, the stress strain curves soften. And then eventually when you hit zero effective stress, you, you, momentarily you have almost zero stiffness 
at the point of zero effective stress. And so you can develop large deformations. And the third plot shows how the strain rapidly grows with the number of cycles. And then the fourth plot shows the RU, this is basically the buildup of pore pressure. And 100% is when you get to zero effective stress. And then the next one is a um, lightly overconsolidated soil with a PI of 15. Same thing, but now you can see that the buildup of pore pressure is a little bit slower. But if you load it enough with enough cycles, you can in fact get it uh, firstly to zero effective stress. Not quite as bad as the sand, it, 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 but it, it, it does reach essentially zero effective stress. So it has zero stiffness, but it took many more cycles to get there. Uh, and as you can see, you, you do essentially get to zero effective stress, but it's harder to get there. And then when you get to a PI of 26, um, you know, if, if the cyclic stress ratio is big enough relative to its undrained strength, you will build up on uh, pore pressure. So pore pressures will develop, the effective stresses will migrate progressively to the left, but you will never actually get to zero effective stress. Uh, it, it never reaches the condition of zero effective stress. It does soften. You can see the stress strain curve has become softer, softer, but uh, after many cycles, there is still some residual stiffness, uh, even under all those levels of cycles. So it never hits zero effective stress, but it has so softened. And so this, this is referred to as cyclic softening. So basically you have a transition from um, non-plastic soils uh, that can liquefy if the magnitude and duration of cyclic loading is sufficient relative to its density. And then you, you slowly uh, cover a spectrum all the way down to where it will not liquefy in terms of the definition of liquefaction of zero effective stress, but it will soften. Um, so there's no hard cutoff of when it will or will not liquefy. It transitions to a material that's more clay-like and less likely to liquefy. So it goes from more sand-like uh, progressively to more clay-like. So if we look at the geology, the case histories show that um, it's mostly young Holocene age deposits. They're mostly non-plastic or low plastic soils, consistent with the lab data we just saw. Also, the soils have little or no microstructure. So microstructure is the structure you cannot see. So the, the Typical examples of microstructure are things like bonding or cementation or aging. So you don't actually see that effect uh, if you were to look at the, the sample, um, but you can see it in its behavior. Usually the material is stiffer uh, due to uh, microstructure. Also, the soils are mostly silica based. There are virtually no case histories of high carbonate soils. Um, and also uh, the soils typically have little or no stress or pre-strain history. Uh, the the depth that uh, cyclic liquefaction occurs is relatively shallow, typically less than 12 meters and predominantly less than 10 meters. And also the groundwater is relatively shallow. Also, there are very few cases that have a thick non-liquefiable crust. Obviously, if the non-liquefiable crust is 10 or 12 meters, then it becomes very difficult to have liquefaction. And then also few cases uh, occur when there are frequent clay layers within that upper 10 to 12 meters. So if you look at lab data uh, in terms of susceptibility to liquefaction, uh, increasingly it's moved to these plasticity criteria based on samples. And then Ray Seed and his colleagues have suggested this uh, sort of modification of the um, classification chart of PI against liquid limit. But increasingly people have moved over to the Bray and Sancho one, which is PI against um, this ratio of the water content to the liquid limit. And so uh, it, when you've got low PIs less than about 10 or 12, uh, and where the water content is high relative to the liquid limit, then it's highly susceptible. And then it sort of transitions towards not susceptible. So once you get up to PIs, in this case, greater than about 18, uh, and seeds about 20, it sort of says generally it's not susceptible. What's interesting to note is when you've got uh, uh, fine grain soils where the water content is greater than the liquid limit, generally these soils also have high sensitivity. So part of this susceptibility is due to the high sensitivity of the high water content relative to its liquid limit. Now, when it comes to CPT-based 
uh, criteria. We've got the soil behavior type chart. This is the one I, I developed in 2009. It was sort of updated. So you've got the normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis and the friction ratio on the horizontal axis, both on log scales. And the key to this is these are soil behavior type charts. They're based on the behavior of the soil. So the CPT is controlled by the strength, stiffness, and compressibility of the soil, whereas traditional classification systems like the uh, unified classification system, they're based on physical characteristics such as grain size, grain size distribution, and plasticity from Atterberg limits. And they're carried out on disturbed samples. So they're physical characteristics, which are uh, linked to behavioral characteristics, but only loosely linked. It's not, a, not as clear as a, the, the behavioral link that the CPT gives you. And if you look at the chart, you see sand-like soils tend to plot up in the upper left-hand region. And this is where the, the cone penetration is particularly typically drained because most sands have relatively high permeability. So the penetration process is predominantly drained. And then clay-like soils tend to plot in the lower right-hand side with lower normalized tip resistance and higher friction ratio. And here, the cone penetration is typically undrained. Most clay-like soils have relatively low permeability. And so the cone penetration process is typically undrained. And then in the middle of the chart, you've got these mixed soils like the silty sands, the silty clays, um, where you can have partial drainage. It, it, it's progressing from predominantly drained penetration in the sand and then to predominantly undrained in the clay. So you can get that partial drainage in the middle. What's also interesting to note are these trends. So in the sand-like soils, increasing normalized tip resistance is associated with increasing density. And then increasing tip resistance and friction ratio is essentially in, uh, and, and a measure of increasing stress history or age or cementation or, or microstructure. So soils with increasing microstructure tend to plot in the upper right-hand corner. So this is where the, the soft rocks tend to plot. And then if you look at clay-like soils, increasing normalized tip resistance is a measure of uh, stress history, increasing OCR. And then decreasing friction ratio is a measure of increasing sensitivity. So data that plots in the lower left-hand corner are generally sensitive soils, soft sensitive soils. And remember, this covers three orders of magnitude of normalized tip resistance. And then um, uh, based on some work that Jeffries and Davies had done in the 90s, uh, came up with this idea of this soil behavior type index, which was recognizing that these boundaries between the soil behavior types were approximately concentric circles. And so they came up with the clever idea that you could have this imaginary center of the circles. And if you calculated the radius, um, it would give you this soil behavior type index, which is essentially an index of the soil behavior. So if the soil behavior type index IC is small, you're up in the sand-like region. And if it's large, you're in the clay-like region. And it works out that it varies roughly from a value of one in the upper left-hand corner to a value of about four in the lower right-hand corner. And it was a reasonable approximation. It's controlled by, primarily by the soil compressibility, which is loosely linked to things like fines content and plasticity. So we, so we know that you know, clean, non-plastic sands fit in the upper left-hand corner, and of course, more plastic clays tend to fit in the lower right-hand corner. And you can see that the IC fits these boundaries reasonably well, particularly up in the sand region. But as you get further down, it doesn't quite fit the boundaries quite so well. Uh, but it, it was a reasonable approximation, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and so when you look at liquefaction case histories, so this is taken from Bollinger and Idris, uh, where they looked at about 300 case histories, and they had plotted them on the soil behavior type chart. The red ones are the sites that liquefied, and the white ones are the ones that didn't liquefy. And you can see that uh, they're predominantly in the sand-like region, where IC is greater than 2.6. So they're generally in that sand-like region. The other thing to note is that each of these case histories is where um, the, the, the researcher had to uh, estimate which layer they thought liquefied, and then calculate the average normalized cone resistance in that layer, and then plot the data on this chart. So each one of those dots is really a sort of a much larger zone of uncertainty that this is the average value, but the real values within the layer that liquefied could have varied uh, fairly significantly depending on the, the geology and the layering. 
Um, and then um, 30 odd year, or actually 40 years ago, uh, we developed the seismic CPT. And so a geophone was incorporated into the cone and using downhole seismic as illustrated on the diagram on the right, it means you can measure the shear wave velocity. And rather than measure it once and get an average shear wave velocity, uh, Typically, when you're pushing the cone, you, you pause every meter and add an additional rod. So during that pause, when you add the rod, you can create a shear wave at the surface and then measure its arrival in the cone. And if, in fact, if you have two geophones a meter apart, you can get the true, true interval, which is illustrated in this diagram. Uh, but if you have just one geophone, you can take one measurement at one depth, for example, five meters, and then push to six meters, repeat the test, and then you basically have the pseudo interval velocity. But again, it's the uh, velocity over that one meter increment. So you get a profile of shear wave velocity with depth every meter. Uh, and what we know is that the shear wave velocity is a very small strain measurement. And so it's quite sensitive to microstructure. And here on the right, it's illustrating that the small strain uh, shear modulus is the shear wave velocity squared times the mass density, and the mass density is simply the unit weight divided by gravity. And so that led us to uh, suggest that you could use the seismic CPT data to identify whether or not soils had significant microstructure. And so we developed this chart on the right. So you've got the normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis, similar to the previous chart. And on the horizontal axis now, you've got what is uh, G0 over the net cone resistance, or G0 over QC. It's the net cone resistance to be a little bit more precise. And so what we know is that G0 is, is measured at very small strains. So it's a measure of the small strain stiffness. The tip resistance is measured at large strains and is a measure of the strength of the soil. And so for well-behaved soils that have little or no microstructure, there's a fairly good link between these two. And that's captured by this ratio, this stiffness to strength ratio. And uh, Schneider and Moss had suggested this simple formula that said you can calculate this, this kg value, in essence, which is the, this line or the intercept of the line. And uh, what we observed is that uh, for most young Holocene age uh, soils, virtually all of the case histories for liquefaction, all fit within a narrow band where kg is from about 100 to 300 with an average value of 200. And uh, what we had suggested was that when you get kg values in excess of about 300, you start to get significant microstructure such as bonding or aging. So older soils and cemented soils tend to fit outside that region. So they have significant microstructure. And of course, uh, they can have significantly increased resistance to cyclic loading, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So James Snyder and Mark Randolph and, and Paul Main, they did a nice paper in 2012 where they sort of suggested a, an update of the soil behavior type. And instead of these sort of concentric circles, they said it should be more of a hyperbolic uh, curves which is sort of close to what I had before, but uh, I'd, I'd more theoretically shown it definitely should be more hyperbolic in, in, in nature. And they had uh, given um, uh, some simplified descriptions, and I've sort of written them in here approximately. And then uh, in 2016, I updated the, my soil behavior type chart to recognize that we, we should put these boundaries in as more um, hyperbolic type relationships. So I came up with a sort of a modified soil behavior type index. I called it IB, so an index for behavior type, and, and gave it a, a simple formula down here. And I also uh, put on this, this, this CD line, um, and this represents the boundary uh, between soils that are dilative at large strains to soils that are contractive at large strains. And I also use more behavioral type descriptions because the problem with the previous chart is it was a behavioral type chart, but it was still using textural descriptions. So we, we were still using descriptions like uh, sand, silts, silty sands, silty clays, clays, et cetera. So we were using those physical textural descriptions, even though it was a behavioral chart. And so I, I was suggesting we move to behavioral descriptions. So now it says that it's sand-like and dilative, sand-like and contractive, clay-like and dilative, clay-like and contractive, and then clay-like, contractive and, and sensitive. 
And then you've got these transitional materials in the middle that could be contractive or dilated. And this chart is for soils that have little or no microstructure. So first of all, you go back, first of all, you use the shear wave velocity to determine whether or not there's microwave, microwave, microstructure when it's combined with the CPT. And then once you've assured yourself there's little or no microstructure, then this CD boundary should be reasonably correct. If there is microstructure, this contractive dilative boundary is no longer valid because the microstructure screws up the location of it. And, and here's just illustrating where that IC of 2.6. And you can see that for soils that plot down the middle of the chart, which is where most young sort of normally consolidated soils end up plotting down the middle of the chart, then IC actually links to IB uh, reasonably well. The, the, the two of them actually link. It's when you get off into the, the side regions, either into the upper right-hand region or the lower left-hand region, then you get big differences between IB and IC. Now, recently, Say and um, Olson and um, Frank, Frankie, uh, they wrote a paper where they suggested an updated soil behavior type chart, and here it is. So you've got normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis. Their normalization is a little bit different. Uh, mine was QTN, which was normalized with a variable stress experiment exponent. Theirs is just a simple normalization divided by the vertical effective stress. So a little bit of difference there, but still essentially very similar. They went for textural descriptions, you know, uh, using these sort of USCS type descriptors, which I think is can be problematic. Um, and uh, and so they defined their what what you could call soil behavior type index, but they called it a delta Q. And this was the equation they came up with. Uh, but if you convert it to a form that's similar to my equation, you can see that they're actually almost exactly the same. The constant 70 in mine changes to 67 in theirs. So they're almost identical. So this delta Q is almost exactly the same as, as IB. So they're, they're essentially the same. And at an overburden where the effective overburden is one atmosphere, both normalized values become identical as well. And so here I've, I've just shown the IB of, of 22, which was the boundary I had suggested. And uh, you can see that it's very similar to theirs. Uh, on their chart, they've also shown fines contents and they talk about liquid limits and, and plasticity indexes. So we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So if we talk about um, linking the CPT back to the lab world, uh, where the criteria was based on plasticity, how does the CPT sort of tie in with plasticity? And Chetin wrote a paper in ASCE back in 2009, and he looked at, at um, lots of sites, mostly liquefaction sites, and uh, he looked at the plasticity index of those sites and showed that, yes, sure enough, in the upper left-hand corner, they were mostly non-plastic, and then the plasticity index increased as you went down and to the right. And so he drew these sort of simplistic uh, relationships showing how the PI would increase as you progress down to the right-hand side of the chart. In other words, as IC becomes bigger or as IB becomes smaller, uh, then the soil becomes more plastic. And then more recently, Nick Ramsey in Australia, he works for Fugro and they do a lot of uh, offshore work. And uh, Nick looked at lots of different sites around the world. They were, they were all marine sites and they had samples and he looked at PI and he came up with relationship. Uh, it also includes the pore pressure, so I can't strictly show it, but it, it approximately is these blue lines. And you can see the similarity between these two, basically saying as you move into that bottom right-hand corner, you generally get into soils with higher PI. And when you're up in the sand-like region, you have lower PI. The one uh, tricky thing is that most of the um, sites in both of these case histories didn't have um, plastic or, or clay-like soils that were had high sensitivities. And we know that um, clay-like soils with high sensitivities plot in this lower left-hand corner. And we know from the mine tailings industry that it's very common to have um, non-plastic or low plastic mine tailings that will plot in this region where they're highly sensitive, they're clay-like, the, the cone penetration is undrained, and they often fit in this lower corner. 
So if we extend and combine the lab data with this data, it says that there's there's clearly some sort of zone in the middle here that says that well, when you're up in the sand-like region, it's typically susceptible to cyclic liquefaction. And when you're in the clay-like region, it's typically not susceptible. And that there's a region in the middle that's marginal. So you're transitioning from, from sand-like to clay-like. And so there's a, a region of uncertainty. And then I've added a, a slight twist to it and said, well, let's recognize that soils that plot in the lower left region um, can be um, low plastic materials um, and they can be susceptible uh, to cyclic liquefaction due to their high sensitivity. Now, back in 2009, this chart on the right, I had suggested that the simplified CPT-based liquefaction method that I developed with Catherine Ride back in 1998 um, could be modified. And instead of having a cutoff at an IC of about 2.6, you could actually transition starting at about an IC of 2.5 and then go from cyclic liquefaction and transition over to recognizing that you can get cyclic softening. And cyclic softening is controlled primarily by the OCR, and so hence the, the relationships are essentially horizontal. And so I had suggested that you could modify the simplified approach and just transition from one to the other without the need of defining cutoff. And that actually works reasonably well. And you can see when you compare it on the right, it is roughly in the right location. Not perfect, but uh, it's, it's not a bad way of, uh, of seeing whether or not uh, you can look at all the soils without the need to defining some rigid cutoff that says it's either is or is not susceptible to cyclic liquefaction. Recognizing that there is no hard cutoff, it actually transitions from one behavior to more like the other behavior. So transitioning from sand-like to more clay-like. So on the right, I've now filled in the diagram and said, so if you're up in the sand-like dilative region, then cyclic liquefaction is possible, providing the magnitude and duration of the earthquake is big enough. Obviously, the higher up in the chart you are, the bigger the earthquake has to be. And if you're below the contractive dilative boundary, then both cyclic and flow liquefaction is possible. And then when you get into the clay-like dilative material, then typically liquefaction is unlikely. And even cyclic softening becomes unlikely because you're getting into the realm of relatively high uh, OCRs. And so um, the, the earthquake would have to be very, very large to, to uh, cause cyclic softening in that region. And when you're in this lower uh, region in the right-hand corner, this is where you've got low OCR, sort of normally to lightly over-consolidated clay-like soils where cyclic softening is possible. And then in the region where you've got sensitive clay-like soils, then both cyclic and flow liquefaction can be possible due to the sensitivity of the material. So that was sort of an overview of susceptibility and how the CPT can be used and how it ties in with our knowledge of lab data and the case histories. Now let's talk a little bit about triggering. And of course, the whole triggering approach it came about from the early work of, of Seed and Idris, which was now over 50 years ago. And they developed what was often referred to as the simplified pr procedure. And they essentially came up with this very nice uh, approach that said you could look at the earthquake demand in terms of the cyclic stress ratio, usually normalized to a magnitude seven and a half earthquake. So they came up with this simplified equation. Um, you don't have to use that equation if you did um, seismicity analysis, you could actually determine what the cyclic stress ratio is. But for low to moderate risk project, most people use some form of this simplified equation to estimate the earthquake demand. And then the cyclic resistance is the cyclic resistance ratio, also normalized to a magnitude seven and a half earthquake. And that's a function of the penetration resistance. And of course, 50 years ago, it was the SPT and, and progressively it's migrated over to predominantly the CPT for all sorts of reasons, such as a continuous profile, more reliable data, et cetera. And the fact that you get more than one parameter. The SPT is just giving you a single blow count, where the CPT is giving you up to six independent measurements. You've got tip resistance, sleeve resistance, pore pressure. You've got dissipation data to give you rate of dissipation and equilibrium pore pressure. And you've got shear wave velocity and also the possibility of P wave velocity. So a lot of information in a continuous profile. 
Now, there was an NSEER workshop in 96, 97, and that resulted in a consensus paper by Yaud, which essentially recommended, you know, the Robertson and Ride CPT uh, based approach for CPT. And then since then, there have been several updates uh, since that 2001. Probably the most notable is, is the Bollinger and Idris one, first uh, in their report in 2014. And we'll talk briefly about that and some of the others. And certainly this simplified triggering approach, suitable for low risk projects and initial screening for high risk projects. And I'll come back and talk more about that a little bit later. If you look at the uh, liquefaction case history database. Um, here it is now. Uh, this is taken from Bollinger and Idris, over 300 case histories. And uh, you can see what the soil type is. Um, the earthquake, generally magnitude 6 to less than 7.6. Um, the uh, peak ground acceleration, generally between 0.1 to 0.65 G. Depth is less than 12 meters. IC generally varies from 1.4 to 2.6 generally. Um, since then, of course, more sites have been added, particularly since the uh, earthquakes in Christchurch, which is now adding significantly number of more case histories. So the number of case histories keeps growing. So um, Seed and Idris back 50 years ago introduced the concept that really the penetration uh, resistance was a measure of state. Because what we're trying to do here is in sand-like soils, the penetration resistance is predominantly drained. CPT is definitely drain penetration. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict the behavior of the soil under undrained cyclic loading conditions. So to do that, uh, we ideally have to go through an intermediary process of trying to estimate the state of the soil, which in the old days we would have talked about relative density. Increasingly, we talk about things like state parameter. Uh, but it, either way, you're, you're going from a drain penetration, estimate the state of the soil, such as the relative density. And then once we have a knowledge of that, we can predict how it'll behave under undrained conditions. And Seed and Idris recognized this concept of clean sand equivalent. I don't think they used that term 50 years ago, but it's now more commonly used. And this was to extend it from clean sands into silty sands, still where the penetration process is drained, but to extend it more further. Um, and uh, in um, 98, I had suggested that you, we could use this soil behavior type IC. Now, of course, it would be probably IB as a correction factor. And also take note here, this clean sand equivalent, I've shown that it is in fact linked to in situ state parameter. I, I published this you know, around 2009, showing that there is a relationship where you can estimate the in situ state from the clean sand equivalent. So there is a link between this theoretical world of state parameter and the case history world um, that came out of the liquefaction case histories. So if I quickly summarize how I did that, um, what we did is we looked at cases, uh, so we, we narrowed it down to a sort of a, a narrow range of cyclic stress ratios. We looked at cases that liquefied and didn't on the soil behavior type. You could draw a boundary, which is curved, and that sort of says that, so for clean sands, with a penetration resistance, in this case, a little over 100, uh, it has the same resistance to cyclic loading for this level of cyclic loading as a, a silty sand with a penetration resistance much lower. And so that relationship leads to this simplified correction on the, the right that said the clean sand equivalent. So I, I could correct that value of the silty sand. I could correct it up to the equivalent clean sand by calculating the IC, in this case, it's just under 2.6, and then multiplying it to get it up to the clean sand equivalent. So we came up with this simple correction factor and said the clean sand equivalent was simply this KC factor, which is a function of IC times the normalized cone resistance. And once you've got that, you essentially have a, a, an infinite family of trigger curves. So you've got the clean sand curve, and then you've got a family of curves for different IC, and they migrate to the left with increasing IC. So it's a simple multiple correction. And then uh, Bollinger and Idris, um, they did a similar sort of thing, but, but they reverted back to the previous sort of seed and Idris approach where they wanted to use fines content. I personally think that was a retrograde step, but that's what they chose to do. So they used fines content and they made an additive correction like the original um, seed and Idris approach. So hence the clean sand equivalent is the normalized cone resistance 
plus a correction, which is a function of fines content. Now the correction is a little bit complicated because it's a function of fines content and the cone resistance. So you've got a family of curves. So it gets a little bit complicated, but it, the end product is the same that you have a sort of an infinite family of, of, of trigger curves. You've got the clean sand base curve and then the other ones uh, migrate to the left with increasing fines content. Uh, as I said, I personally don't like fines content because it's a physical characteristic of which you're trying to apply it to a behavioral response. And uh, the other thing is they kept the original term that that uh, that we had all used back in the the 90s, which is QC1N. So uh, and you notice I've been using this uppercase Q because in the site investigation world, the, the, the move has been is that when the penetration resistance is normalized, it goes to uppercase Q. So whenever you see lowercase Q, it's non-normalized. When it goes to normalize, it goes to uppercase. But they're essentially the same thing. You know, so the, the uppercase QTN is essentially the same as this lowercase QC1N. Little bit tricky because it is using QC. It ideally should be QT, which means it's correcting for water effects. It's a small issue, but it's a small detail typically doesn't matter in clean sands and salty sands, but it does play a role when you get into the clay-like soils. And more recently, say, you know, he updated the soil behavior type chart, came up with a new soil behavior type chart and suggested this parameter delta Q. And I've shown that delta Q is essentially the same as, as IB, they're, they're the same thing. And they looked at case histories. They added a few more. They had about 400 case histories. And here they've shown it in a three-dimensional plot. So you've got cyclic stress ratio on the vertical axis, then you've got normalized cone resistance as the x-axis, and then the, the, the y-axis, as it were, going in the other direction is this delta Q, which, remember, is essentially the same as IB. And what they showed is that the, the cutoff is essentially at about 20 down here. You can see it curves over sharply and cuts off at about 20. And uh, they said that it applies to soils that can have liquid limits up to between 30 to 40 percent and PIs from 50 to 20. So they're they're pushing it to higher uh, plasticity index. And I'll comment on that a little bit later. Uh, and they comment that for deterministic, you, you use the um, probability of liquefaction of 35. Now, if I switch that over, this is what it looks like if you plot it in the more conventional. Uh, I, I, this is not actually their curves because they didn't show this plot. So I'm just showing it for illustration purposes. So again, you've got a clean sand curve, which they say occurs at the delta Q of 90, and then it migrates to the left and a delta Q of 20, it's essentially cut off and, and, and uh, it no longer is susceptible to cyclic liquefaction. So when you talk about probability of liquefaction, of course, back uh, 25 years ago when we developed the, uh, the Robertson Ride method, uh, we didn't have enough data and uh, didn't do a probabilistic analysis because there wasn't enough data. Uh, but subsequently, Ku uh, and um, others in 2012 published where they, they went back the, through the, the, the updated database and they looked at what the Robertson and Ride method would be in terms of probability. They came up with this simplified relationship, and here it is illustrated on the right. And it showed that for a factor of safety one, it has a probability of about 35%. So similar to what Say is suggesting, um, uh, and you'll see later that uh, Bollinger and Idris are suggesting 15%. Now, interesting enough, if you want a probability of 50%, you have to drop the factor of safety to 0.9, and that's illustrated on the right here. And so let's talk about Bollinger and Idris. Here's their uh, updated method. They had more case histories and they went probabilistic so they could uh, show lines of different probability. And uh, they were recommending a probability of liquefaction of 15% if you do the deterministic approach. In other words, a little bit more conservative. And as I said, say at L had recommended 35 and it works out the mine is about 35 as well. Um, when it comes to shear wave velocity, um, Andrus uh, and Stokey had suggested a method, and then um, Kay and Adele had updated it with more case histories. But I quite like this uh, plot from Ahmadi, um, where he essentially says, yeah, there, there's variation, and about 
uh, all you can get out of it is if the shear wave velocity is very low, then it's susceptible to liquefaction, and a shear wave velocity is greater than around 270 meters per second, or roughly 300 meters per second, then it's likely not susceptible to liquefaction. And so I agree with this, that the, the shear wave velocity is influenced by many factors, particularly microstructure. And so small changes in shear wave velocity can result in very large changes in cyclic resistance ratio. And so whether or not you have the accuracy in the shear wave velocity uh, to act, get reliable predictions of uh, the resistance ratio is questionable. And it's better to, I think, use it just as a supplement to the CPT. So if you're doing seismic CPT, you can do both. But, but keep in mind that the shear wave velocity is more likely to be just a supplement to the primary shear wave velocity, the, the, the CPT, sorry. And part of it, of course, is the CPT, you're collecting data every one or two inches and you're getting a continuous profile, whereas with the shear wave velocity, you're getting a more average profile, typically over averaging every meter. Although here in, in California, it's quite common that they do it every five or even 10 feet. Um, so they're averaging it over a much larger depth increment. So let's talk a little bit now about consequences of cyclic liquefaction. And so you've got post-earthquake settlements, and that's caused by reconsolidation of the liquefied soil. So it's gone to zero effective stress, and then after the earthquake, it starts to reconsolidate, and the, the water starts to flow outwards, and uh, which of course can cause uh, ground ejecta, and the, the soil uh, reconsolidates. Uh, and then of course, if there is a lot of um, upward flow of water, you can get ejector. And then if there are buildings with foundations, if those buildings are rather poorly designed, then you can get high shear stresses and that can induce additional um, shear induced movements close to the footings. So, you know, you've got reconsolidation, ejector and shear induced. And then of course, you've got lateral spreading due to ground geometry. So if there's slightly sloping ground or if there's a free face, you can ratchet up movements. And then, of course, if you've got very uh, loose material, you can get a loss of shear strength, which if you've got slopes can result in flow liquefaction. And we'll touch on that uh, right at the end. Um, and, and that's really where you've got these loose contractive soils. So there's a lot of uncertainty with uh, cyclic uh, liquefaction induced deformations. You've got um, uh, complexities around soil characteristics, state, plasticity, degree of saturation, cementation, stress history, et cetera. You've got complexities about earthquake characteristics, level and duration, frequency contents, et cetera. And then you've got site characteristics, the topography, uh, geometry, stratigraphy, lateral variability, piezometric profile that may not be hydrostatic, um, and then poor and water and void ratio redistribution. And then you've got other effects such as two and three dimensional effects, ground cracking, low permeability surface layers, and nearby foundations. So a lot of complexities that make it difficult to actually predict deformations reliably. Um, so when it comes to post-cyclic liquefaction deformations, it's useful to keep in mind that when you're dealing with sandy soils, uh, estimating deformations is difficult. We're not very good at actually estimating uh, deformation in sandy soils under static loading conditions, let alone the complexities of, of cyclic loading, uh, especially the complexities of real earthquakes. But for low to moderate risk projects, empirical simplified models are common and they're often appropriate. And that's because you can get continuous profiles of estimated deformations. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but for high risk projects, numerical analysis may be appropriate if initial screening indicates there's a, uh, there's a risk. So if you've got a high risk project, potential for significant cost savings, et cetera, uh, high consequences if failure should occur, uh, then it may be appropriate to do a full blown effective stress uh, numerical analysis if the simplified methods indicate that you could have a problem. Now, uh, when we published the um, post-earthquake settlement uh, paper, CPT-based method with Zhang. He was one of my graduate students. Uh, we sort of illustrated that it depended on the ground conditions. So for example, if the liquefied layer was a great depth, it was less likely to give you a problem. But if it was at very shallow depth, it could give you a lot of problems. And of course, if you had multiple layers, it's like which one liquefies first? Because if the lower one liquefies first, then the upper one may not liquefy. And then of course, uh, lateral variability, if it's localized, then differential settlements could be larger. Um, so uh, Jonathan Bray uh, gave his seed lecture 
uh, in uh, 2022. And he wrote a paper about it in 2023. And you can access it through the YouTube here. It's an excellent uh, overview. Jonathan did a good job. And in the process, he talks about an updated approach to estimating post-cyclic liquefaction settlements. And he goes through the three different uh, uh, sources of settlement, the, the volumetric reconsolidation, shear induced, and then ejecta. And so for the volumetric, he sort of updated the Zhang et al. method, and, and that's written in his recent paper. And then for shear induced, Bray and Macedo talked about it. But what I got out from that paper was that if you've got a well-designed foundation, then typically the shear induced uh, deformations are, are generally small. You only have a problem if it's, if it's a rather poorly designed footing where you don't have a very large factor of safety for bearing capacity. And so if the shear stresses are very high, then you can get additional shear induced uh, displacements. And then the third one was injecto. And I, I really quite like this. And, and here it's illustrated and it brings up some useful points because what the method by Hadabarat and Bray in 22 showed, and, and I'm showing an example here from their paper. So you've got um, um, a non-liquefied crust. So it could be due to the either the soil type, it's clay-like or it's above the water table, but, but there's a non-liquefied layer and they define that depth as ZA or ZA. And then below that, you've got a liquefied layer and the thickness of that is ZB. And you calculate the factor of safety and red is where it's less than one. And then you calculate, so you've got the total, uh, so you've got the, um, in this case, hydrostatic pore pressure, and then you've got the total stress. And of course, you, you calculate the excess pore pressure every time the factor of safety gets less than one. And then when it hits the total stress, then you've got zero effective stress. And then you ca they calculate the excess head. And you can see that the it's the excess head closest to the ground surface that has the biggest effect on uh, flowing water upwards and then taking ejecta to the surface. And this has been uh, coded into the, the software slick, so you, you can now use this method. And what they showed is that, that the, the likelihood of having ejector-induced damage is a function of, of this liquefaction demand, which is the amount of excess pore pressure due to artesian flow, and the crust resistance, so the strength and thickness of the non-liquefied crust. And what this, you know, here's what they show that the, the, the strength of the crust is, if it's a clay, it's controlled by its undrained strength. And if it's a, uh, and you, you, you calculate that from an NK factor, if it's a, if it's a sand, it's from the, the um, constant volume friction angle, both of, both of which you estimate from the, the cone data, and he's got the method of how to calculate it. But what comes out of this from the little chart on the right is it so, so if you have a site that um, has a severe risk of ejector, then sometimes an easy solution is simply just to increase the resistance of the crust. You may not be able to increase the thickness of it, although if you add um, compacted fill, you obviously increase the thickness. But if you increase the thickness and or strength of the crust, then you can push uh, the relationship to the right. So you can go from a severe condition of ejector to a very minor or, or non-existent simply by increasing the, the strength of the crust. So for new buildings, sometimes just doing ground improvement in the upper 10 or 15 feet with surface compaction type techniques can significantly reduce the risk of ejector and also, of course, reduce the risk of uh, differential settlements because you have a stronger uh, crust at the surface. So um, what we've observed with these um, uh, CPT-based li simplified liquefaction approaches, doesn't matter which method you're using, generally uh, they're observed to be relatively conservative. And you saw that that often recommended uh, using trigger relationships that have probability of liquefactions less than 50%. So 50% would mean it's 50-50 you know, either way, whether or not it will actually trigger liquefaction. So if you're using 35 or, or as low as 15%, then you're obviously adding some conservatism in. And uh, generally, we're, we're observing that these methods are quite conservative. And so there are some modifications that you can make. One is that you can look at what the 
soil in the upper 10 meters is like, and I'll talk about that in a second. You can look at uh, weighting the effects as a function of depth, recognizing that it's the shallow soils that often have the biggest effects. We'll talk about removing transition uh, zones or thin layer corrections, and then also accounting for microstructures such as aging or cementation. And then also it's useful to compare the different methods for consistency. Are they all giving generally similar results? And then also bounding the results. So remember, much of what we do isn't co correct. The goal is to get the correct answer. And so if you run the simplified methods with no, no modifications, and that maybe is giving you an upper bound. And then if you apply various modifications and then see what the lower bound solution is so that you know that the correct answer is likely within those bounds. And then you can use your judgment to decide where exactly within the bounds. And I'll talk about that in a second. And usually it's a risk informed uh, approach of how you uh, make that judgment. So first of all, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, I apologize if I wouldn't be able to pronounce that name correctly. Uh, so uh, these researchers correctly identified that if you looked at what the average soil behavior type index IC was in the upper 10 meters, that if it was mostly sand, of course, it would have a low IC up around 1.5. But as you got more clay layers within the upper 10 meters, that average value progressively got bigger. And so they looked at these um, severity indexes. So they, you know, the, the, the manifestation of surface damage due to a severity index. And of course, the, the very first one was this liquefaction potential index, which was su suggested by Iwasaki. That's been modified to a, a, an LPI Ishihara sort of modification. And then uh, out of Christchurch came this liquefaction severity number, all based around the same principle where they sort of look at the factor of safety, they sum it up as a function of depth, they weight it as a function of depth, usually putting more weight to the shallow and less weight at depth, et cetera. So they're all following similar sorts of approaches and they all have slightly different criteria of what would um, result in surface uh, damage. And so, but what, what you get out from this research, if you just look at this middle one, so if you had a, uh, a liquefaction potential index, you know, modified Ishihara inspired. So you had a value of 10. So if it was nearly all sand with an average IC of 1.5, you have a 90% uh, likelihood that surface manifestation would occur. But if that, if there's some clay layers in there and that average IC is now down at 2.7, then it drops all the way down to around 40% probability. So the more clay you have in the upper 10 meters, the less likely you are to get damage at the surface. Um, and then there's a depth weighting uh, effects. You know, we obviously talked about it here with these severity indices. And of course, uh, Jonathan had it with his ejector estimates where he's building in the effect of depth. And that there's also a similar, a simple linear weighting. Chetin had suggested it in his SPT paper of 2012, where he suggested a simple weighting factor where you put maximum weight at the ground surface and then eventually take it to zero weight at a depth of around 15 meters. And that's simple to apply. And then um, for many years, I talked about this transition effect that when you push the cone in, for example, when you're pushing in clay and you start to penetrate a sand, then the tip resistance starts to build up in the sand, but it takes a certain penetration depth to reach the full resistance within the sand. So yeah. while the data is transitioning from the clay to the, the sand, you are collecting data, but that data is misleading because it's not really giving you the correct value in the sand. And so uh, that misleading data in that transition can uh, add extra conservatism. And so one option is to identify these transitions and to remove them. And there's a little algorithm in the software slick that can do that for you. So you can remove those and just see what effect it has. And I'll illustrate that in a minute. And then of course I talked about uh, aging or microstructure. So uh, Professor Andrus, Ron Andrus, uh, uh, had a couple of nice papers on aging, and he had suggested this parameter, what he called the measured uh, to estimated shear wave velocity ratio. So this MEVR ratio. So you would measure the shear wave velocity, you would estimate it based on the CPT, and he gives a little uh, relationship of how to do that. And then he said, so the bigger that number is, 
relative to the case histories, then you can make a correction for aging. And it's illustrated here on the right. And I made a slight modification to it where it sort of said, well, that uh, that chart we're using to estimate microstructure, not, not just aging, but generally microstructure, it recognizes that most of the liquefaction case histories have a kg of 200. And so you could use that as your baseline. And so I sort of simplified it a little bit based on that 200. And so similar sort of principle. So here's an example of comparing the different methods. So four CPTs and here sort of illustrating that Bollinger and Idris quite often gives a slightly more conservative answer. On the right, you can see that CPT and shear wave velocity. The downside with the shear wave velocity is it's sort of averaged over a greater depth interval. And I want to quickly go through an example here. I chose a site that's got mostly sand over clay. So it's got about uh, roughly 40 feet of sand, a little bit of a clay layer in the middle, and then it's over a clay layer. And I chose this because the underlying clay layer has an IC of about 2.6 so, and uh, an, I, an IB between that 22 and, and 32. So, uh, you know, it's right in that marginal region. And so if you looked at this without thinking about it, you might say, oh, the, you know, the sediments are liquefiable all the way down to 80 feet. Uh, but if you look at it carefully, it says no. First of all, we look at the large pore pressure. So the, the cone penetration is, is undrained. You've got large excess pore pressure. So it turns out that this is a stiff clay. It's got a high normalized tip resistance. So it's got an OCR of about 10. The normalized shear wave velocity is greater than 300 meters per second. So if you go into the chart, it says there's significant microstructure based on shear wave velocity. The pore pressure also shows significant microstructure, but it is plotting in that, that transitional region. So it, just based on that alone, it would look like it was marginal, but the other two bits of information say, no, this is essentially a very stiff clay. It's almost a soft rock, uh, given that high kg value, the high shear wave velocity. So it's non-liquefiable even though the IC is close to 2.6. And so if you bound the solution, so if you run the method, so this is happens, it's running the Robertson and Rise. So I put in a, a, a conceptual earthquake, magnitude seven, PGA of 0.24. And of course, using the default factor of safety of one with a probability of liquefaction of 35%. So with no modification, it kicks out about two and a half inches of settlement. If you do the depth weighting, it drops down to, uh, 1.3 inches. And then if you also remove transition layers, it drops a little bit further. And as you go to 50% probability, it then says no modification is about an inch and a half. And with all of the modification, it sort of gets less than an inch. And so it's it's bounding. It's somewhere between two, two and a half inches to less than one inch, but it's much more likely to be less than an inch. And so your engineering judgment, uh, depending on the risk of the project, you you would you likely come up with that the predicted settlements are more likely to be less than an inch, even though initially it was going to give you two and a half inches. So if I briefly talk about probabilistic approaches, so for low to moderate risk approaches, you can use simplified approaches, similar to what I've just talked about. And um, Kevin Frankie and, and Scott Olson have a paper, and, and Kevin is the next speaker next month. And he is going to be talking about the, the the say approach, I think. And I think he's also going to talk about uh, probabilities. I, I hope he is. And what they've correctly identified is that sometimes we've got cumulative effects of, of likelihood. So you might be designing an earthquake that has a likelihood of occurring of one in every two and a half thousand years. Um, and of course, the triggering might have a probability of liquefaction of 35%. And then your deformation model likely has a, a probability of around 30%. If you sum all of those up, you're actually designing for a one in 25,000 year event, even though you think you were designing for a two and a half thousand year event. In other words, you're designing with an, an order of magnitude extra uh, uh, lower level of likelihood of occurrence. And of course, uh, also, variations in groundwater. Here in California, you, you have to design for the maximum groundwater level uh, possible at the site, and that often has a, uh, a likelihood less than one to it. And so that's an added level. And so, for example, if it had a, a just a 10% likelihood that that high water level would actually occur, then the overall 
probability would drop another order of magnitude. So you'd be actually designing for a one in 250,000 year event, not the 22 and a half thousand year event you thought you were designing for. So for high risk projects, Steve Kramer in his seed lecture uh, talks in detail about uh, full blown probabilistic analysis. These are computationally intensive. And what Steve generally shows, he shows examples with blow counts. And so for a typical 50 foot borehole, you may have 10 blow counts, but for a 50 foot CPT, you have 750 data pairs on average. So it becomes computationally extremely intense to do a full blown probabilistic analysis for a CPT based uh, approach. So quickly, I want to talk about, OK, so how do you how do you decide what site characterization to do? And many years ago, I suggested it should be a function of risk. And here I'm just summarizing it. So you go from low to high risk. And so for low risk project, go out, push some CPT, get some disturbed samples, do some index tests and a simplified approach. And then with increasing risk, you start to sort of add in things like surface geophysics. Um, seismic CPT, some samples and some basic lab testing, and then for high risk, um, surface geophysics, seismic CPT, and then uh, possibly some high quality samples and more advanced lab testing. Uh, so increasing sophistication of site characterization with the increasing level of risk. And here, this just summarizes that uh, when you're in sand-like soils, you're going to be dominated by in-situ testing. But once you get down to these clay-like soils, then sampling becomes more viable and, and, and should be considered for, for moderate to high-risk projects. So my recommendations for CPT-based cyclic liquefaction. So for low-risk pro projects, apply these simplified methods, recognizing that there's some built-in conservatism. Bray and Olea in their recent paper are actually suggesting 50% probability. And, and I think that's the right way to go, is if you're going to estimate um, deformations and damages, we should be uh, using a probability closer to 50%. Uh, minimize compounding conservatism. So don't use factors of safety of liquefaction that's greater than one. And in fact, with my method, you would actually use a factor of safety of 0.9 if you wanted 50% probability. And then apply modifications uh, to bound the problem and then be informed by case histories to reduce the conservatism. And then estimate expected range of outcomes, applying appropriate engineering judgment informed by the project risk and by case history experience. And so for moderate risk projects, you probably do sort of uh, simplify probabilistic. And then when you get to high risk project, uh, you would run the simplified uh, methods as your screening to determine whether or not you have a risk and what the risk is likely to be. In other words, how much likelihood of liquefaction is there going to be? And then if there is a, a, a likelihood, then uh, investigate the likelihood of doing more advanced method that may involve sampling and even uh, effective stress numerical analysis, uh, if it warrants it and if, the, 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 if it's appropriate for the project. Every project's different, depends on the uh, level of cost savings, et cetera. So where do I think the future is? And uh, I think we're reaching the limit now of the simplified approach. You know, we, we keep adding more case histories. The trigger curves are not changing very much. People are coming up with, quote, new curves, which are really just modifications of previous curves. They're not really changing very much. Um, so I think we've reached the limit of that approach of taking each site as a data point. Uh, but we are entering in this area era of big data. So Christchurch has 33,000 CPTs, nearly all of which experienced four earthquakes. So we have over 2,000 data points per site. So we have about 250 million data points in just that database from Christchurch alone. So I think the future is, is where we have the possibility that you may run your deterministic and your, your probabilistic approaches for analysis, but you may also submit your, your CPT profile to a database where the database will search for similar profiles uh, in the database uh, that are very similar to yours. And then that would maybe for a range of criteria. So, you know, the, the, the more criteria it hits, the closer it is to matching your profile. And then it, it, it would come back and say, we found a couple of sites that is very similar to your profile, and this is how they behaved in, in various earthquakes. Uh, 
So it would be um, a sort of a, a case history type approach, but using uh, what would require modern image recognition and artificial intelligence techniques. We're not there yet. I think that that's likely to be where the future, but it's it's going to take a while to get there. But I, I think we are heading in that direction. But of course, it'll be supported by our simplified approaches and, and our, our current both deterministic and probabilistic approaches. Now, I'm just going to briefly close out because uh, I, I need to talk about static liquefaction to, to round it out. Uh, so static liquefaction is different where you've got loose, saturated, contractive materials. They have very low liquefied strength relative to the driving force. So if the slope is relatively steep, uh, at least higher than the liquefied strength, then you can get instability. And if there's sufficient volume of material that's losing strength, then you actually get instability occur and you can get a flow slide. Uh, and this is a major design for ta major design issue for tailing stabs because they're they're steeply sloping slopes that they have an embankment. Uh, they they're typically loose and saturated and contractive, so it's a big issue. And case histories have shown it's a problem. And so this is the famous case history from often referred to as the Brumadina one. I'm not going to show the video. This is just an image from it. But the dam suddenly collapsed. You know, moments before it collapsed, it looked perfectly fine. There were people on the dam. Uh, there were cattle on the dam. Everything was fine. There were no signs of distress. And then suddenly it went. And then 15 seconds later, um, this major failure occurred. And then five minutes later, the whole tailings facility had released and flowed downstream and, and unfortunately resulted in um, more than 250 deaths. And so the sequence of flow liquefaction is a bit different, where, again, you is it susceptible to strength loss? Is it saturated and contractive? Um, evaluate the stability. So if it were to, to um, lose strength, uh, would it be unstable? And if it's unstable, would it be triggered to lose the strength? And what comes out is basically that since the consequence is often catastrophic, it says that if the soils are susceptible and instability is possible, in other words, the factor of safety is less than one with the liquefied strength, and the consequence is high, in other words, people could lose their life, then it's usually prudent to assume that the trigger will occur at some time in their life. So for flow liquefaction, trigger becomes insignificant, and the focus is more on the liquefied undrained strength, and, and I updated the correlation. So these red lines are contours of liquefied undrained strength, and you can see they're all below the contractive dilative boundary. So if there's little or no microstructure, if it plots in the contractive region, you can determine that it's susceptible, and then you can estimate what the liquefied undrained strength is and see if it'll be stable. And if it's not, assume it will liquefy. Um, and so everything I've said is summarized in this uh, CPT guide. I know it's a bit of a plug for it, but you can download it for free. So uh, I've covered a lot of ground quite quickly, but essentially most of it is covered in the CPT guide. And so I, I, I know I've moved along quite quickly and I've probably gone a little bit over time, but I'm happy to take some questions. And the nice thing, it is recorded, so you can go back over and look at the recording if you miss some of the things that I moved somewhat quickly through. So I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, and that was a fascinating presentation, information packed, and uh, I know there's some questions queuing up. The first one is from Roberto Sanchez. With regards to the susceptibility effects of microstructure, bonding, and cementation, do you know of anyone or university group who's doing research on its effects? Well, probably Ron Andrus is the first one. He, he's he's looked at aging, and he's using shear wave velocity, um, but you know, microstructure is, is encapsulated in that approach. So I, I know he's looking at it. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of others. Uh, for, for years now, I've been saying the big issue is going to be that if you have soils that are, are lightly cemented, which is what we considered was the case at Brumadino, so lightly cemented materials that could give you a slightly higher shear wave velocity. Uh, but uh, if, if you were to hit that sort of material with a small earthquake uh, that, that wouldn't exceed the strength of the bonding, then it would behave very well. But if you hit it with a really big earthquake that could exceed the threshold strain and break the bonding, then it may perform quite badly. So the issue of microstructure may also be linked with the size and magnitude of the earthquake, if the earthquake would be big enough to actually destroy the bonding. 
But that would only be the case, I think, if, if it was very light bonding. All right, thank you. This one from Shahid Hussein. Some near shore, near shore soils will have NMC, same as liquid limit, but they are still stable, don't liquefy. Excuse me, any specific reason? So repeat, uh, he said MS. I NMC, oh. unfortunately, I'm not sure what that acronym is. I think it might be the classification acronym. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, and so, and it was saying why these are not liquefiable? Yes. Uh, well, since we're a little unclear on the question, uh, it may be that they're in that marginal region. You know, remember I said it's a spectrum from uh, behavior that's more sand like to a spectrum that's more clay like, and you obviously transition from one to the other. There isn't a, a definitive line that says suddenly you change behavior from one to the other. So you gradually change the behavior. And so sometimes these materials fall into that region. And, and, and I missed it, but one of the things in the uh, recent Say et al. paper for liquefaction, uh, they added extra cases to the, the database. And they argued that they thought that some of the layers were liquefiable, whereas others were considered they were clay-like. And so it's questionable, you know, they added that into their database, but I suspect that some of those examples may have been examples of cyclic softening, not cyclic liquefaction. And that's the subtlety of the, the description between cyclic liquefaction and cyclic softening. It obvi it's obviously a transition from one to the other. And so uh, I, I think some of their cases that has IC larger than 2.6, may well have been cases where they were really clay-like soils uh, that were experiencing softening. So they were deforming, so they were resulting in some deformation. And you know, the, the classic one is they showed them the moss landing example where there was significant lateral spreading. And most people had chosen the sand layer below the clay, and they're saying, no, we think the clay layer liquefied. And I think that's actually a case of, no, the clay layer experienced cyclic softening, and so it did experience deformation, but it did not experience cyclic liquefaction. It's a subtlety, and I think the subtlety comes from our simplified methods where we try to determine a cutoff, an, an IC cutoff. And I'm partly to blame because 25 years ago, I suggested an IC cutoff of 2.6. And you know, I, I always implied that it was approximately 2.6. But of course, once I wrote it down, everyone said, no, it is 2.6. It's like, well, no, it's 2.6 plus or, plus or minus. Uh, and I, I never sort of specified what the plus or minus is. But in 2009, when I said, hey, why don't we try and develop a method that avoids the cutoff and it transitions from 2.5 to 2.7. So it's trying to, to recognize that it does transition. Well, that brings me to a nice segue. Uh, Nick Anderson actually asked, besides I sub C being greater than 2.6, uh, Q sub C 1N being greater than 150 TSF, and a factor of safety greater than 1.1 or 1.3 for critical structures. What other metrics do you use from CPT to exclude liquefaction in a given point, data point or layer? Ooh, wow, uh, that was complicated, wasn't it? <laughs> With all of those numbers thrown in there. Um, but in a way, that example I showed, I know I went through it quickly because we were running out of time, but I chose that example because you could look at that cone profile and say, I've got sand over a weak material, and the weak material has an IC of around 2.6, and you know half of it is less than 2.6. And so a lot of people said, oh, I, I, that layer is liquefiable, and if you run the simplified method, it would have captured you know, half of that deeper layer, where when you looked at it more closely, it said, no, hold on a moment. This this deeper clay layer is actually a, a very stiff clay. It's almost a soft rock. It's clearly not liquefiable. Um, so based on, if you'd taken samples, you would have said, no, this is non-liquefiable. And if you'd looked at the geology, it would have said, no, this is a soft rock. It's non-liquefiable. If you looked at the shear wave velocity, it said it's non-liquefiable. So if you'd look at the whole package of information, it would have said, no, this is non-liquefiable. We're going to uh, ignore that it liquefies. And so you have to look at the total package of which geology may play an important role. Excellent. Uh, this question from James Bella. What is normalized tip resistance and why is that relevant? Ah, OK, well, that goes right back to basics. Is So um, Peter Roth, when he gave his ranking lecture in um, 1984, 
Uh, he correctly said that when you're using um, penetration resistance, he was talking primarily about the CPT, but also it applies to the, the SPT. It says we shouldn't be talking about just penetration resistance because we know that that number increases with depth. So he showed an example. He said, if you have a normally consolidated clay and if you push the cone in, then the, the penetration resistance will increase linearly with depth. It just keeps getting bigger. So if you have a very thick layer of normally consolidated clay, then eventually the tip resistance will get to become quite a big number. Um, and so he said, you have to normalize it with overburden pressure. And when you do that, it normalizes to a single value and it stays constant with depth. And he correctly then said, well, you know, and then you can go on and you can predict things like OCR, which of course is, uh, if it's a normally consolidated clay, OCR is one and it's one all the way. And so, you know, the normalized value is a constant value all the way with depth and hence it links to OCR. So the reason we normalize data is it, it, it links to soil behavior more correctly because soil behavior is controlled by effective stresses. And so with increasing effective stress, soils get stronger and stiffer. And so if we normalize the penetration resistance, we um, account for that um, influence of overburden pressure. And of course, we do it with the SPT. Uh, you, you measure the SPT N value, but ideally you should look at N1, where it's been normalized to an atmospheric pressure of one. Excellent. Next one is from Carson Cheng. Can results of CPT soundings be skewed in undocumented fill soils? Ooh, well, I, I, well, I said the question back is, what do you mean by skewed? Um, undocumented fill, uh, that's, that's a broad statement too. Um, I mean, the, the thing about the CPT is that the CPT rarely lies to you. You know, if the, if the cone is working and, and you know, there, there are, are procedures in the ASTM standard to make sure the cone is working correctly, you, you take zero load readings before and after to make sure everything's working fine. So it rarely lies to you. So what it's doing is it's telling you how the material is behaving around the cone while you're pushing it in. And so um, it's, it's telling you the real behavior. What you have to do is to look at the data and interpret it to fully understand what it's trying to tell you. And I quickly went through some examples of here. I happen to stop on the soil behavior type chart. And so, you know, when you've normalized the cone resistance, you can link it to things like relative density and OCR and sensitivity. So depending on the trends of the data is telling you how the material behaves. And so when it says, you know, skewing the data, it says, no, I mean, it, it's, it's measuring whatever is, is in the ground. You just have to interpret it correctly. Now, uh, when, when you're normalizing it by overburden pressure, one of the things you have to be careful of is making sure you're using the correct effective overburden pressure. And so things like, are you uh, estimating the soil unit weights correctly? And sometimes in, quote, undocumented fills, uh, particularly in, in landfill, uh, where the material may not be soil. And so it's important, of course, to get the unit weights correct so that you're calculating the over total overburden correctly. And then of course, the next thing to do is to make sure you get the piezometric profile correctly. And, and often we assume it's hydrostatic, but it's not always hydrostatic. And so of course, the CPT with pore pressure measurements, you do dissipation tests, which get you equilibrium pore pressure, which gets you the piezometric profile. So it, it gives you all the things you need to know so that you can make as best an estimate of the vertical effective stress so that when you normalize the data, you are in fact normalizing it reasonably correctly. And when you do that, it's gonna tell you how the material is behaving. Thank you. This one is from, and pardon me, Costas, Costas Lanzatidis. You mentioned about the future of cyclic liquefaction assessment, the modern image recognition. Was that related to video cone? No. Now, what I meant there is that, so a typical cone profile now has a, a, a measurements of tip, sleeve resistance, and pore pressure. Three measurements, all measured roughly every inch or every couple of centimeters. And so for, you know, a, 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 50, a 15 meter sounding, you know, you have, what did I say? Um, uh, I forgot what the number was now. Um, 700, um, 750 data pairs. You have a lot of data. And so if you try to um, 
do the typical engineering approach is, well, I'm going to look at every line of data one line at a time. It becomes computationally uh, too intensive. And so what I think we're going to have to do is we're going to have to have a standard way of presenting the data. So the data is always presented in a standard format. You basically take an image of that, that data and then you scan the database for identical images. So just as we do facial recognition, et cetera, then you use artificial intelligence to say, I've got an image of my cone data, which is tip resistance, sleeve and pore pressure, all as a function of death, all standardized in terms of its scales, et cetera. And then I'm gonna search the database for a very similar image. And then when I found those matching images, I'm gonna come back and present them to you. So it says, here's what they look like. Now you can make the judgment about whether or not they are good matches to your site and a little bit of the, the, the geologic history. And then of course, how, did, how well did they perform uh, in previous uh, earthquakes? So we're, we're maybe a long way from it, but I, I do think that that is one approach that we're we're getting enough data now that that is feasible to do. Thank you. This one is from Mike Frizz. Do you have an opinion on use of depth reduction factor for surface expression of liquefaction induced settlement, e.g. Chetton 2004? Yep. Simplica simplification of a complex problem, but maybe reasonable. Yes. Um, so after Chetton wrote that paper, I jumped on it fairly quickly and said, yeah, I like this approach because when you go back to the um, liquefaction potential index that Iwasaki had suggested back in the, the 80s, that's what he did. He, he had a linear weighting with depth where he basically said, well, we know from case histories that when we have liquefaction occurring at depth, it typically doesn't cause much surface damage. It's only the shallow liquefaction that causes surface damage. So he had a linear weighting. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the the people at Christchurch in New Zealand, when they use the liquefaction severity index, they use a, a weighting. Theirs is nonlinear. So theirs drops even faster with depth due to the nonlinearity. Um, so that they likewise said, no, with increasing depth, uh, it, if I have a, a layer that liquefies at depth, it has a much smaller role than if I have a layer liquefied at shallow depth. Um, so it's well established that that exists. And, and Jonathan Bray's approach with ejector shows the same thing. If you have high pore pressures at shallow depth, it can have a bigger effect uh, for ejector than one at greater depth. So there's overwhelming evidence that it shows an effect. And what I'm suggesting is you don't necessarily do it and apply it, but you, you can bound the solution, as I showed in that example. Go with the, the simplified approach as uh, published and then apply a depth weighting to see if it affects the results. Of course, if it doesn't affect the results, it's basically saying, well, most of the liquefaction is shallow and therefore not having much effect. If it's having a huge effect, it's saying, hey, most of the liquefaction is occurring at depth. And so you need to reconsider whether or not that's likely to be a problem for your project. And of course, you know, Jonathan's approach at looking at pore pressure as a function of depth is another way of looking at it. And, and that's why I showed that that style of presentation as a nice visual way of capturing it. Yeah, here it is. There it was there. You know, it's it's sort of that that red region of excess pore pressure. It sort of illustrates that if you have a red region down at 50 feet, it has very little effect as opposed to the one at 10 feet. And I think that concludes our questions for the seminar. Um, thank you all for uh, attending and sitting in. Um, this can also be reviewed at any time on YouTube. Thank you very much, Dr. Robertson, for an incredible presentation and uh, a very informative one, too. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. What a great day. Uh, I'll echo what Tim said and to give everybody a thank you for sticking around this long. It's always amazing. We always worry that people are going to put set an hour aside and then disappear. We still have a really good crowd out there. To everybody who submitted questions, thank you. We really appreciate it. These would not be what they are without the interactivity. So uh, thanks for all your thoughts and questions that you put in the chat box. And that, of course, makes this a wonderful experience for everyone. There is one more episode in the Keller Seismic series, and it is coming up next month in August. It'll be Kevin Frankie from BYU, and you can already register for that on Eventbrite. And you know what? 
you're probably going to get an email about it since you attended today. And Tim smiled, so I know you're going to get an email about it. You're on the list. would, (laughs) We would love to see you back here for that. Again, if you liked what you saw today, of course, click like, subscribe, and get notifications. And, you know, we'll let you know when we post new stuff to the YouTube video, to the YouTube channel as well. You can go watch Peter's Seed Lecture from 2015. You can watch Steve Kramer's Seed Lecture from 2018. You can watch John Bray's from 2022 or about 800,000 other things that we've produced video for over the past 15 years or so. You could do nothing but watch videos on the YouTube channel for the rest of the summer, and you'd still have some left when the weather starts to get cold. So thanks again, everybody, for sticking with us today and for showing up and having a great time and participating. We really appreciate it. Peter, for a great presentation. Tim, a great job emceeing. Sean did a great job producing today. And we will see all of you very soon. Thanks again.